In this week's Weekly Story Jokes, we bring you our best joke compilation of the week. These jokes are sure to make you laugh from the first one to the last one. These are our story jokes which we love to generate. This week we bring you five stories, starting with a story about a fishing, until we end with a story about a general and the First World War. So, sit back, get the popcorn, and get ready to laugh until your stomach ache. In the first story of the day, we bring you the similarities between fishing and business. Hilarious. In today's cartoon story joke, we bring you a tale about fishing. Is fishing and business so different? Today, we try to answer these questions and end in a hilarious reality. Ah, fishing. A time-honored tradition of early mornings, questionable bait choices, and enough existential dread to rival a board meeting on a Monday. But hold your horses, or should we say, bait your hooks, because beneath the surface of this seemingly serene activity lurks a gold mine of metaphors for the chaotic world of business. That's right, folks. Grab your metaphorical tackle boxes, because we're about to reel in some hilarious and surprisingly apt comparisons between fishing and the cutthroat game of getting ahead. The first lesson in fishing and business is that preparation is key, unless you like the taste of defeat. Let's face it, nobody enjoys staring at a motionless bobber for hours. You got to be prepared. You research the best spots, the kind of bait the finicky fish are craving, worms, minnows, maybe a tiny disco ball, and ensure your rod and reel can handle the fight. Because let's be honest, a business with a faulty printer during a presentation is about as effective as using a pool noodle for a fishing rod. Similarly, in business, failing to plan is planning to fail. Market research becomes your bait selection. A solid business plan is your trusty fishing rod and a well-equipped team, your tackle box. Just like overestimating the size of a fish by the bobber's movement, underestimating the competition can lead to a rude awakening. Be prepared, people, or you might just end up with a mouthful of metaphorical minnow and a bruised ego. The second lesson in fishing and business is that patience is a virtue, especially when you're dealing with a stubborn CEO. Fishing is a masterclass in patience. You cast your line, wait, and maybe wait some more. Fight the urge to check your social media every two seconds, and then, bam, a tug. But even then, it might be a pesky catfish or a rogue sandal, not the prize-winning marlin you envisioned. Business is no different. Building a successful company takes time, perseverance, and the ability to weather storms, both literal and metaphorical, looking at you, Karen, from accounting. Don't expect overnight success, and don't get discouraged if that big client you've been chasing throws you back like a used bait fish. Keep casting your line, refine your approach, and eventually, you'll reel in the rewards. The third lesson is to embrace the unexpected, because Murphy's Law applies everywhere. Just when you think you've got the perfect cast, a rogue squirrel snatches your hat, because apparently, squirrels are jerks. Or a flock of geese decides your bobber is a worthy opponent in a synchronized swimming competition. Fishing is a constant exercise in adaptability. You got to roll with the punches, improvise new bait presentation methods, duct taped hat as lure, anyone, and laugh at the absurdity of it all. The business world is a masterclass in the unexpected. Clients change their minds faster than a fish changes direction. The market takes a nosedive for seemingly no reason, and your competitor suddenly starts offering free lifetime supplies of pizza with every purchase. Seriously, who even does that? The key is to stay flexible, think on your feet, and maybe invest in some squirrel-proof headwear. The fourth lesson is that teamwork makes the dream work, unless your teammate keeps stealing your worms. Let's be honest, wrangling a giant tuna is a two-person job, unless you're Popeye with superhuman spinach-fueled strength. You need a buddy to help you net the catch, celebrate the victory, or commiserate the loss, and maybe even share the questionable fish puns that inevitably come with the territory. Business thrives on collaboration. A strong team with diverse skill sets 
can overcome any obstacle, navigate treacherous market currents, and even deal with the office know-it-all who keeps stealing your best ideas. We see you, Steve, from marketing. Remember, a lone fisherman might be good, but a team of passionate professionals is an unstoppable force, assuming they share the worms. The last lesson is that you must respect the catch and maybe throw it back sometimes. There's a certain nobility to the act of fishing. You appreciate the beauty and power of nature, the delicate balance of the ecosystem, and the importance of responsible practices like catch and release because nobody wants a fish that's been sunbathing for hours. Similarly, in business, it's important to be mindful of the impact you have. Sustainable practices, ethical treatment of employees and clients, and a focus on giving back to the community are all crucial aspects of long-term success. After all, a company that pillages resources and leaves nothing but destruction in its wake won't last much longer than a bait shop during a zombie apocalypse. All right, all right, let's skip to the best part, the joke. A successful businessman on vacation was at the pier of a small coastal village when a small boat with just one fisherman docked. Inside the small boat were several large yellowfin tunas. The businessman complimented the fisherman on the quality of his fish and asked how long it took to catch them. The fisherman proudly replied, Every morning, I go out in my boat for 30 minutes to fish. I'm the best fisherman in the village. The businessman, perplexed, then asks the fisherman, If you're the best, why don't you stay out longer and catch more fish? What do you do the rest of the day? The fisherman replied, I sleep late, fish a little, play with my children, spend quality time with my wife, and every evening we stroll into the village to drink wine and play guitar with our friends. I have a full and happy life. The businessman scoffed, I am a successful CEO and have a talent for spotting business opportunities. I can help you be more successful. You should spend more time fishing and, with the proceeds, buy a bigger boat. With the proceeds from the bigger boat, you could buy several boats. Eventually, you would have a fleet of fishing boats with many fishermen. Instead of selling your catch to just your friends, you can scale fishing to thousands. You could leave this small coastal fishing village and move to the big city, where you can oversee your growing empire. The fisherman asked, but how long will this all take? To which the businessman replied, 15 to 20 years. But what then? Asked the fisherman. The businessman laughed and said, that's the best part. When the time is right, you would announce an IPO, sell your company stock to the public and become very rich. You would make millions. Millions. Then what? The businessman said, then you would retire, move to a small coastal fishing village where you would sleep late, fish a little, play with your kids, spend time with your wife, stroll to the village in the evenings where you could sip wine and play your guitar with your friends. The fisherman replied, I have all of this right now. <laughs> In our second story of the day, we bring you a student wanting to date this very important girl. However, his car is not good for first impressions. In today's cartoon story joke, we're about to embark on a comedic odyssey that'll have you snorting laughter harder than a car backfiring on a first date. So, put down that papyrus scroll, because seriously, who even uses those anymore? And get ready for a story that's funnier than a clown car full of monkeys juggling bowling pins. Let's face it, most car histories are about as exciting as watching paint dry. Numbers get tossed around like confetti at a clown convention. Design choices are dissected with all the enthusiasm of a sloth reviewing salad options, and you're left feeling like you need a nap and a double shot of espresso. Not necessarily in that order. But the history of cars? Hold on to your hubcaps, gearheads, because this is a joyride packed with more twists, turns, and flamboyant characters than a soap opera fueled by nitrous oxide. Act one, from horseless carriages to horseless headaches, the early days. The story begins not with sleek, shiny automobiles, but with glorified horseless carriages that were about as reliable as a toddler with a glue stick Imagine these contraptions sputtering down dirt roads, 
spewing black smoke like a particularly grumpy dragon and sounding like a herd of kazoos with a grudge. These early cars were about as aerodynamic as a brick and about as user-friendly as a medieval torture device. If you managed to get one started without throwing a wrench in frustration or more likely at the car itself, congratulations. You were basically a pioneer of the automotive rodeo. Then there was the second act, the assembly line shenanigans and the rise of the Tin Lizzie, the early 1900s. Then came Henry Ford with his genius idea, the assembly line. This revolutionized car production, making cars affordable for the average Joe, or Josephine, as the case may be. The problem? The assembly line also led to a hilarious era of uniformity. Imagine a world where every car looked exactly the same, like a million Model T Fords in various shades of, well, black. Because as Henry famously said, you can have any color you like as long as it's black. The fashion sense of the automotive world was about as exciting as a beige sock convention at that point. Now came Act 3, the gangster getaway cars and the chrome-covered calamities, the Roaring Twenties. The 1920s roared onto the scene with flappers, jazz music, and of course gangsters with getaway cars that were about as subtle as a disco ball in a library. These vehicles were loud, flashy, and often about as aerodynamic as a bathtub. Imagine Clyde Barrow and Bonnie Parker screeching around corners in a car that looked like it was dipped in chrome and sprinkled with diamonds, because subtlety was clearly not their strong suit. It was a time of outrageous car design, fueled by gangsters, bootleggers, and a whole lot of questionable taste. Then came Act 4, the oil crisis, the disco ball on wheels, and the rise of the Japanese invasion. 1970s, 1980s. The 70s were a time of fuel shortages and a desperate need for a change. Cars shrunk down to the size of overgrown hamsters and fuel efficiency became the new cool. But let's not forget the disco era, where cars became rolling disco balls on wheels with enough vinyl and shag carpet to make Austin Powers jealous. Imagine cruising down the street in a car that resembled a small nightclub complete with flashing lights and a questionable sound system that wheezed out your favorite disco tunies. It was a time of questionable taste, to be sure, but hey, at least you could party on the go. Enter the Japanese. These automotive ninjas swooped in with fuel-efficient, reliable cars that offered a surprising amount of zoom for their buck. Suddenly, American manufacturers were scrambling to keep up, leading to a hilarious period of Me Too design choices and questionable quality control. Remember those American cars that looked like melted marshmallows with questionable chrome accents? Yeah, those were a product of this era. Basically, American car design went from bold and brash to confused and plasticky in the blink of an oil crisis. All right, folks, ditch the dusty old history books. Let's buckle up, shift gears, and launch ourselves into the joke faster than a politician changes their stance on a Tuesday. So, there was this college student, let's call him John, who drove the automotive equivalent of a dust bunny, the oldest, most beat-up beetle in existence. One day, John pulled off a miracle. He landed a date with the most beautiful girl in his grade. Let's call her Veronica. John was ecstatic, but his joy quickly sputtered out like his car engine. There was one major problem. There was no way he could roll up to Veronica's house in that jalopy. Desperate, John resorted to the ultimate broke college student move. He begged his dad for the keys to his brand new Volvo X30. Now, this Volvo wasn't just any car. It was his dad's prized possession, cherished more than John's existence, probably. John approached his dad with a sheepish grin. Dad, he pleaded. Can I borrow your car for tonight? It's a super important date, and I can't exactly impress Veronica with the Flintstones mobile. John's dad, clearly conflicted, sighed. Son, he said, you know that Volvo is basically my baby. If you even put a single scratch on it, you'll be living on ramen noodles for the next decade. But fine, go impress your princess. The date went flawlessly. The food was amazing. Veronica was stunning and miraculously, the Volvo remained pristine. 
John, feeling like Casanova himself, walked Veronica back to her house. As they said their goodbyes, John noticed a massive dent on the Volvo's gleaming side, right where his dad always parked his lawn gnome. Panic surged through him. He rushed Veronica into her house, apologized profusely, and then hightailed it to his friend's garage, where they spent the entire night meticulously repairing the dent. Exhausted but triumphant, John finally crawled into bed. The next morning, John awoke to his dad's enthusiastic singing, a war crime usually reserved for weekends. He dragged himself downstairs, his heart sinking at the sight of his dad cheerfully inspecting the Volvo. John braced himself for the wrath of a thousand sons. But his mom interrupted his thoughts. John, honey, what's wrong? To his utter bewilderment, his dad's face broke into a wide grin. The dad answered, I am so confused. You know the spot where we accidentally bumped the car yesterday? It's not here anymore. <laughs> Our third story of the day is about a big game hunter that have trained this crocodile to do many tricks. Very funny. Forget cheesy monster movies with crocodiles lurking silently. Buckle up, because in today's cartoon story joke, we're about to expose Hollywood's biggest croc lie. These toothy titans have a past wilder than your Aunt Mildred's family reunion. Vegetarian crocs, surfing reptiles, and even marathon runners? You won't believe it. Remember those cheesy monster movies where crocodiles lurk silently in the swamp, unchanged since the dawn of time? Turns out, Hollywood lied, again. Buckle up, croc aficionados because we're about to dive into the gloriously weird and wacky evolutionary history of these toothy titans. Sure, there are your standard issue modern crocs, scaly, toothy ambush predators, but that's just the tip of the prehistoric iceberg. Crocodiles, their alligator and gorilla cousins, belong to a much larger family called Crocodylomorpha. This ancient lineage is like a twisted family reunion filled with bizarre relatives that would make even your eccentric Aunt Mildred blush. Imagine a crocodilian that looked like a short-snouted armadillo munching happily on fruits and ferns. That's Simosuchus for you, a vegetarian croc who wouldn't know a zebra from a zucchini. Or how about the Thalatosuchians, the ultimate reptilian surfers who sported flippers instead of feet and cruised the prehistoric oceans. These weren't the only oddballs in the croc family. Terrestri Suchus, the reptilian whippet, was a sleek runner built for speed, not lurking. Think of it as the greyhound of the prehistoric world, minus the fancy racing jacket. This incredible diversity makes modern crocs seem like a bunch of conformists. It's like they all got together and decided, hey, let's just be slow, aquatic ambush predators. Seems safe. Well, safe maybe, but certainly not very exciting. Speaking of slow, the whole crocodiles are sluggish giants. Stereotype gets a major debunking here. Turns out, their ancient ancestors were fast-growing, active creatures. Imagine a T-Rex-sized croc sprinting across the landscape. That's the kind of energy we're talking about. So, when did things take a slow turn for crocodiles? The prevailing theory linked their sluggishness to their aquatic lifestyle. But here's the plot twist. Fossils reveal a slow-growing croc that lived way before they even dipped their toes, or rather, claws, in the water. Why this landlubber croc decided to chill out on the growth spurt is still a mystery. Maybe resources were scarce back then, or perhaps they were just tired of constantly being outrun by their dinosaur neighbors who were busy breaking land speed records. Another fascinating discovery is the origin story of Crocodylomorpha. These scaly pioneers first graced the earth in what is now Europe. Then, somewhere in North America, the croc and alligator family lines split. Crocs, with their newfound tolerance for salt water, became the ultimate globetrotters, colonizing Africa, Asia, and Oceania. Meanwhile, alligators and their kin stuck mostly to the Americas proving you don't always need a passport to have a good time. 
So the next time you see a crocodile basking in the sun, remember, this seemingly simple creature has a rich and surprising past. They've been vegetarians, surfers, even marathon runners. They may not be the most talkative bunch, but their evolutionary history speaks volumes, or maybe just hisses a whole lot. All right, folks, ditch those dusty textbooks and forget everything you thought you knew about crocodiles. We're about to trade prehistoric snooze fests for a story that's wilder than a bar fight at a hippo wedding. A big game hunter had caught a large crocodile and taught him a few tricks. He walked into Ladies' Bar in Falaborwa, put the crocodile down in the corner, and ordered a double. Soon afterwards, he had the crocodile on the counter and was amusing the customers with a few of his tricks. He then patted the croc on its head and it closed its jaws. When the applause died down, he patted the croc on the head again. The croc opened its jaws and the hunter stuck his head into it. After a while, he pulled it out, patted it on the head again, and the croc closed his jaws. As the evening wore on and the drinks began to flow, one customer said, I'll bet you a double you won't put your family jewels in its jaw like that. The hunter patted the croc on the head, unzipped his fly and rolled out his family jewels and lay them to the safety of his trousers, patted the croc on the head, and the reptile closed its jaws. He then asked, Is there anyone else who would like to try this trick? One old lady sitting in the corner of the bar said, Yes, I wouldn't mind trying it. But you mustn't pat me on the head like that. In our fourth story of the day, we bring you this DEA agent with too much confidence to suit the badge. Will that work? In today's cartoon joke, we wonder what happens when a DEA agent with a narc's t-shirt hiding under his suit rolls up to a farm. Let's just say his badge might not impress the most dangerous thing he'll encounter. And it isn't a suspicious tomato plant. Attention all aspiring drug lords. Don't worry, the feds aren't reading this. Probably. Thinking about cooking up a batch of the blue stuff in your basement lab? Hold on to your hazmat suits because here's a crash course on the DEA, the guys and gals who would love to bust down your door and replace your chemistry set with a participation trophy in jail. What is the DEA, you ask? Well, picture this a group of highly trained badge-wielding folks with a serious case of caffeine jitters and a wardrobe that screams Miami Vice on a business trip. Their official title? The Drug Enforcement Administration. Now, before you start sweating under your fedora, here are some fun facts to keep in mind. Budget Bungle. The DEA has a budget that could buy a small island nation a lot of legal weed. However, some folks whisper they're more interested in seizing drug money think mountains of Funyuns and questionable fashion accessories, then stopping the flow of, well, drugs, med school mishap. The DEA has a talent for scheduling medications with proven medical benefits as illegal substances. This has led some to question if their meetings involve sipping herbal tea or something a little stronger. Fashion faux pas? Imagine a world where every day is dressed like a 1980s cop day. That's the DEA life. While their suits may be sharp, their undercover skills might leave something to be desired. Think Borat goes undercover at a rave. International intrigue, maybe. They're the so-called rock stars of drug enforcement, jetting off to exotic locales to chase down elusive drug lords. But let's be honest, their biggest international busts probably involve intercepting a shipment of questionable herbal supplements. Now, the DEA does some good stuff, don't get us wrong. They catch bad guys, stop illegal drug trafficking, sometimes, and even have a killer take back your meds program to keep expired prescriptions out of the wrong hands, looking at you, Aunt Mildred, and your questionable pill collection. But hey, a little humor never hurt anyone, except maybe that undercover agent who got busted at a disco for excessive enthusiasm on the dance floor. So, the next time you hear about the DEA, remember, they're the folks who bring the enthusiasm and questionable fashion sense to the fight against illegal drugs. Just don't get caught snacking on your grandma's anxiety meds 
or they might come knocking with a warrant and a serious case of the munchies. Buckle up because we're about to meet a DEA agent whose fashion sense is sharper than his instincts. This guy, with a suit so pressed it could iron wrinkles out of time travel. A DEA agent with a pressed suit and a swagger that could curdle milk pulls up to a dusty farmhouse. Stepan out with sunglasses perched on his nose, he cracks his knuckles and approaches a weathered farmer. All right, buddy, the agent says, voice laced with authority. I need to inspect this property for any illegal substances you might be cultivating. The farmer, a man with a sun-baked face and a slow drawl, leans on his shovel. Fair enough, he says, but you best steer clear of that yonder field. The agent scoffs. Mister, he booms, puffing out his chest. I have the full backing of the federal government. You see this badge? He reaches into his pocket, whips out his ID, and practically shoves it into the farmer's face. This badge means I can go wherever I damn well please, no exceptions. Now, do we have an understanding? The farmer, trying hard not to grin, mumbles an apology and ambles off to tinker with his tractor. A few minutes later, the piece is shattered by a blood-curdling scream. The farmer looks up to see the DEA agent, face pale and tie flapping in the breeze, being chased across the field by a bull the size of a small tank. This beast wasn't your average pasture ornament. It had horns like sharpened fence posts and eyes that could turn curds back into milk. With every thunderous bellow, the bull gained ground, and it looked certain the agent would be launched into the stratosphere before reaching the safety of the fence. The farmer, unable to contain his amusement any longer, throws down his tools and sprints towards the fence line. As the agent scrambles closer, desperately clawing at the barbed wire, the farmer leans over and yells with all his might, Show him the badge! Show him the badge! <laughs> in our final story of the day, we have a general visiting the soldiers in the First World War. The punchline is truly very funny. In today's story joke, we wonder what happens when a general visits the troops in a war. But lest first delve into the First World War, or as it was called, the Great War, a farce of epic proportions, with slightly less death. Ah, the First World War, a time of glorious mustaches, trench foot chic, and absolutely no idea what the other guys were even doing over there. Buckle up, history buffs, because we're about to take a whirlwind tour through this war that was basically a giant game of confused hopscotch with deadly consequences, mostly for the poor pigeons. It all started in 1914, when Archduke Ferdinand of Austria, a man whose hobbies included collecting novelty thimbles and accidentally starting world wars, got assassinated. Now, you'd think royalty would have better security than a grocery store parking lot at 2 a.m., but apparently, all it took was one overly enthusiastic Serbian teenager with a bad aim and a worse sense of humor to set off a chain reaction more explosive than a room full of teenagers and their first chemistry sets. Countries started declaring war on each other faster than you could say, Kaiser Bill needs a new hat. Alliances, those flimsy friendship bracelets of the political world, were yanked this way and that. Germany fresh off a successful yodeling competition win, decided to invade Belgium because, well, honestly, nobody's entirely sure why. Maybe they were just hangry? Meanwhile, Britain, ever the gentleman, except when they were stealing land like it was a particularly shiny teacup, declared war on Germany because, you know, when your buddy Belgium gets trampled, you offer moral support and maybe a cuppa. France naturally joined the fray because, well, France and Germany have a long and storied history of friendly disagreements that usually involved a lot of shouting and the occasional flung baguette. Now picture this. Millions of young men, most of whom couldn't tell the difference between a map and a napkin, are shipped off to fight in a war nobody really understands. They're armed with itchy wool uniforms, rifles that backfired often, and a healthy dose of jolly good cheer. Or in the case of the Germans, a fervent belief in the power of sauerkraut. The trenches, those delightful mud moats of misery, became the soldiers' new home. 
Imagine a giant muddy ditch filled with bored men, perpetually damp socks, and enough rats to make even the most hardened New Yorker flinch. Communication between the sides was interesting. Since yelling across a muddy battlefield wasn't exactly conducive to polite conversation, the soldiers resorted to more creative methods. There was the ever-popular launch a cow with a message strapped to its tail technique, surprisingly effective but messy, and the classic write a passive-aggressive note and tie it to a pigeon's leg. Less messy, but pigeons have terrible aim. Battles were a chaotic ballet of misplaced enthusiasm and questionable tactics. One particularly memorable encounter involved a British battalion bravely charging a German trench, only to discover it was completely empty. The Germans, it turned out, had staged a fake retreat, leaving behind a single, very bored private with a gramophone playing a jaunty polka tune. The British, thoroughly confused but strangely invigorated by the polka, ended up having a tea party with the bewildered German soldier. Of course, there were moments of true heroism and sacrifice. But let's be honest, war is mostly about mud, boredom, and a desperate search for anything remotely entertaining. Enter trench art, the ultimate expression of, I'm stuck in a ditch with nothing to do but sharpen rusty spoons. Helmets were transformed into ashtrays, shell casings became elaborate lighters, and soup cans morphed into surprisingly realistic portraits of Kaiser Wilhelm with a particularly impressive unibrow. The war dragged on for four long years, a testament to the sheer stubbornness of all involved. Finally, in 1918, with everyone utterly exhausted and sick of trench foot chic, the fighting stopped. The Treaty of Versailles was signed, a document so confusing and full of loopholes that it basically guaranteed a sequel WWI, anyone? The Great War, a conflict that began with a misplaced bullet and ended with a misplaced comma, left behind a legacy of destruction and a healthy dose of survivor's guilt. But hey, at least it gave you some fantastic trench art and a newfound appreciation for descent plumbing. And now that the history is clearly understood, the committee will be very much appreciated. So, take of your helmets of and get the popcorn ready. It's joke time. A general visit an army hospital to check on the conditions and inspire the troops. It's World War I, trench warfare is living hell, and the men could really use some inspiration. The general starts talking to the wounded soldiers. He goes up to the first man and says, what brings you in here, son? The soldier replies, sir, I got dysentery in the trenches, something awful. The general asks him, how are they caring for you in here? And the soldier replies, Well, sir, every day the nurses put a cool cloth on my head and they clean my behind with a soft brush. The general asks, Is there anything else we can do for you? And the soldier says, No, sir, the nurses are doing the best they can. The general seems satisfied, thanks him for his service and moves on to the next man. The general approaches the second man's bed and asks, What brings you in here, son? The soldier replies, somewhat embarrassed, Sir, I got gonorrhea from a woman while I was on leave. The general laughs and says, It happens to the best of us, son. How are they caring for you in here? And the soldier replies, Well, sir, every day the nurses put a cool cloth on my head and they clean my privates with a soft brush. The general asks, Is there anything else we can do for you? And the soldier says, No, sir, the nurses are doing the best they can. The general once again seems satisfied, thanks him for his service and moves on to the next man. The general approaches the third man's bed and asks, What brings you in here, son? The soldier tells him, Sir, I got strep throat in the trenches. The general asks, How are they caring for you in here? And the soldier replies, Well, sir, every day the nurses put a cool cloth on my head and they clean my throat with a soft brush. The general asks, is there anything else we can do for you? Actually, sir, there is one thing, said the soldier. When they start with that brush in the morning, can I be the first to be treated? <laughs> if you liked our joke, then please watch our next joke by clicking here. <laughs>